for the presentation of um, our topic for tonight, which is emergence, indigenous feminisms, environmental justice, and health equity. This is a part of the Health Justice Futures virtual series, which is organized and sponsored through the Center for Health Equity Research and the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University in, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And Health Justice Futures is a part of this campaign that we have uh, here called the Fairness First Campaign. And tonight's guest speaker, we're thrilled to have Jahan Giron, who um, is an indigenous feminist, a painter, a writer, an organizer, and a leader in indigenous environmental and climate justice. I will go ahead, well, we'll hear from her pretty soon. She'll tell us all about herself and we'll get to know her and how we are related to her. Um, but we'll go ahead and proceed forward. Next. Um, actually, I didn't introduce myself as the guest. So very briefly, um, my name is Carmen Lita Chief. I go by Carmen or Carmen Lita. Um, I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation and I work here at the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative or SHRC at NAU as a senior research coordinator and have been with the center for about five years now. And uh, I'm part of the community engagement core that is um, working hard to put on these events to help engage conversations around health equity between uh, community members, community organizations, and with um, scholars and academics, researchers who are interested in promoting health equity through the work that they do in various disciplines at Northern Arizona University. And uh, we have our website link there, here at the bottom. So if you want to check us out later, please do so. Next. So a couple of things that um, we want to ask of you as our audience members tonight. Three things. So in the spirit of engaging and uh, getting to know one another and just really feeling feeling like we want to promote community and connectedness, especially during such a, a virtual event such as this one, uh, we do want to ask you, if possible, if your internet service allows, please keep your camera on to help strengthen that engagement and that connection during the talk tonight um, so that we can form community through the talk. Second of all, um, unless prompted to speak, uh, we would like to ask you all to stay muted throughout the talk. Uh, and of course, we will let you know when we want to engage in conversation with you all. And then third of all, um, please stay engaged in the conversation and please, please participate during the Q&A portion of the event. I think um, a lot of us know that we get, uh, we get, actually get a lot of the value from community through those interactions that are allowed during the Q&A portion. So we would love to hear your thoughts, your opinions, your experiences as it pertains to everything that we share tonight through discussion. Next. So actually, before we get into this slide, we do have a poll for you. And Alexandra is going to get that ready. Alexandra Semeron Longorio is our um, our tech person tonight. So you know we want to get a sense of where everyone is at in terms of their knowledge around indigenous feminism. So our question to you is, how would you rate your level of knowledge about indigenous feminisms? So we'll give you a couple more seconds. We have close to everyone. Okay, there we go, 100%. All right, so as you can see there, we're ending the poll and sharing the results with you. So it looks like pretty much um, a little under half of you have, let me see, actually a little more than half of you have an a medium understanding or higher, which is pretty good. And that will help us kind of know how to navigate these conversations that we have with you tonight. 
Um, so thank you very much for sharing. And that concludes our poll, our first engagement poll with you all. Okay, so very briefly, I know that Jahan is going to um, go over and expand a lot about uh, knowledge, the knowledge areas around indigenous feminisms. Um, I actually have spent a lot of time recently listening to podcast episodes, uh, various ones featuring um, indigenous women who have discussed their initial introductions to the idea of feminism, like the first time they heard of it, what did they think, did they connect with it? And actually in a lot of, in many of those conversations, um, these women had described um, a negative reaction to the term feminism. And it was, you know, a lot of the times it was because um, they just did not connect to the issues that were central to, to what was seen as mainstream feminism. Um, and they had written, largely written it off as a movement that centers on the issues of gender equality that mainly uh, matter most to white women. And so it was really hard for them to, to see their connection to it or see, where, see themselves in that movement. So a lot of the times off the bat, indigenous women would say, well, I'm not a feminist because I already come from a people or a community, a culture that centers women um, and their equal role in society. So why would I, why would I call myself, myself a feminist? And I was actually, I, you know, when I first came into contact with the term and the concept, I was one of those people too. I'm like, I don't know if I, if I jive with that, but after learning more about um, how colonialism, colonization, white supremacy, settler colonialism, they all are connected to the idea of indigenous feminism and some of the uh, issues that matter most to indigenous women, then it started to make sense. So for, for the purpose of conversation here, we define it as both a movement and a set of diverse intersectional frameworks informed by the issues which concern indigenous women and which largely differ from those of the mainstream, the mainstream movement around feminism. So Jahan, like I said, will expand further, but as a starting point, many of the issues important in the struggle to reclaim the cultural and the quote unquote traditional gender roles um, that are promotive promotive of balance in community really center on relationships, particularly um, in that second bullet, that with nature and the land. And this requires efforts to decolonize systems and structures in our communities that um, uphold imbalance and um, create or manifest violence rendered through patriarchy and, col and colonialism. So as we wrap up this slide here, I just kind of want to leave you with um, a quote by Sa the Salish scholar Luana Ross, who says, Indigenous feminism promotes Indigenous sovereignty as a people in order to maintain a vital and spiritual connection to the land in order to survive as a people. So, you know, it really centers on, on the recognition of how both gen all genders that we recognize in Indigenous communities uh, we all have a place, a purpose, uh, there's codependency there and interconnectedness that, that we recognize there. So everybody, there's a belonging there and there's a balance there. And that then connects to the relationship that we have with the land. So land is central to all of this, as well as that promotion of tribal sovereignty when it comes to indigenous feminism. But um, before we go on to our next couple of slides and then Jahan will take over, I wanted to just pose a question to you all. So if you want to unmute, please do so. And you can verbalize your, your answer or um, you can also answer in chat. But my question is, is there anything else you would like to add to this understanding of indigenous feminism that is presented here on this slide? So in my brief uh, 
summarization, you know, we really centered on the centrality of land, um, the importance of decolonization efforts and the promotion for tribal sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty. Uh, we did mention challenging the gender roles that have been shaped by colonialism, white supremacy and patriarchy. Is there, is there anything else that we're missing here? I know it's, it's a very brief description that we went over. Okay, I understand it's 5.30. Some of us probably had um, quite a challenging day, but um, if you want to just offer up something at the, at the conclusion when we have Q&A, uh, we can also do that as well. So we'll go ahead and move on. So this quote here is from First Nations, um, scholar and activist Leanne Simpson. And I really like this quote that actually came from her from one of her books. I'll I'll have the I'll have the title ready for you in just a bit. But um, this to me really speaks to the force of colonialism, how it impacts um, oh, a, a native woman and an indigenous woman and her connection to land and the environment. And she says, I understand colonialism as an overwhelming dominate, dominating force in my daily life that continually attacks my freedom and well-being as Kwe, um, which I understand as woman. Uh, colonialism tries very hard to keep me off my land. It tries very hard to ensure I cannot speak my language think as my ancestors did, find comfort in elders or the river or the lake of rice. It tries very hard to get me to think in a particular way. It tries very hard to get me to move about my territory in a particular way. It controls how I make a living and how I feed my family. It tries to control the relationship I have with my children. It tries to control my, sexual, my sexuality, the, the ways I express my gender, how I care of myself. It creates a world where I am never safe. Next. And this is going to be uh, my last slide before we do get into Jahan's presentation. Again, these are just primers so that we can all kind of start off on equal footing. Um, but for me, because land and relationship to and with land is such a central part of this discussion about uh, Indigenous, the, the concerns that are most important to Indigenous women and liberating from these gender roles that have been shaped by colonialism, it's really important that we think more deeply about what we mean when we talk about land. So Seneca scholar Mashana Goman had asked, what do we mean when we talk of land? Because um, the way that uh, colonizers, settlers, and their logic conceive of land is they try to do so in a way that abstracts the understanding of land. And that's, collect that's connected to um, them wanting to co-op land, to take land, but for us, from the indigenous understanding, place is created in the process of remembering and telling stories. So she calls, when she talks of land, she talks about this concept of storied lands because there's narratives, creation stories that really emphasize that, that connection to land. And it's necessary to decolonization um, is reclaiming that land physically and ideologically. So th again, thinking deeper about what do we mean when we talk about land, because it's not just an empty space. It's not a space that we occupy, it's deeper than that. So the quote that I really love from her says, the stories that teach us how to interact, how not to act, how to survive and our responsibilities to each other are what give indigenous nations meaning. They hold us together through time and beyond the boundaries of states. So as we proceed forward, just kind of think about, you know, what your own understandings are of land and thinking a little bit be deeper and beyond that, and then really connecting that with what Jahan has to share with us this evening. So take it away, Jahan. 
All right, let me share my screen. Give me a moment, everyone. Okay, and then let me put this into full screen and get rid of this and move that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so actually, uh, great. I can't see you guys because I'm showing my screen right now. So, you know, Carmen or Alex, if there's some reason you need to get my attention, um, unmute yourself, please, and let me know. All right, so yeah, hey, everyone. Um, she Jahan Giran Yenish Yef, Twitch Eatney Nishle, Dona Hesle Bashes Chin, Lashe Dasha Che, Dona Hesle Dasha Nulle. Hello again. My name is Jahan Giran. I am Navajo on my mother's side and Black on my dad's side. Here's some pictures of my family so you can get a sense of where I'm coming from. <clears throat> I'm Twitch Eatney Bitterwater Clan. Um, and then, as I said, African American, my dad's side, and then my maternal grandfather, my Che, is Ash Che. So, yeah, a relatives out there, um, clan wise and not. Um, thank you for you know being here. Thank you to Carmen and Alex and um, the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative. Got it um, for inviting me to speak. You know, um, giving me some time. Um, and thank you all for coming to listen to what I have to say. I will do my best to make it interesting and worthwhile. Also, thank you for um, uh, coming, even though the event was postponed. I got sick like right before the talk last week. And so I'll just thank you so much to y'all for showing up and then to the organizers, Alex and Carmen, for giving me that leeway and um, pushing me to prioritize feeling better as opposed to just pushing through and getting through the conversation. Yeah. Cool. So let's get started. All right. How do I... Okay. So um, a little bit about me. So here's some pictures. This is kind of, I think, epitomize what has been my work for most of my adult life. On that top left is me when I was like a little 21 year old, just getting involved in the environmental justice movement. Um, this is what I've done, you know, since I went to college, since I graduated college, this is what I cared about was environmental justice, about one, like connecting, reconnecting, building some sort of relationship with my own homelands and my own people. You know, when I left, uh, I should say I grew up in, um, Sawmill, Arizona, which is up the hill from Fort Defiance, Arizona, if any of you all know where that is, or Winder Rock. I graduated from Winder Rock High School, a fighting scout, and I went to college in California, and at that time, you know, as a 17-year-old young woman, you know, I was really excited to leave the reservation. I, I was like, I'd never been anywhere, and I had grown up with a lot of the negative things that we see, you know, in, on our reservation, like um, alcoholism and domestic violence and, you know, violence in general, I was ready to leave the reservation and never look back when I graduated. Um, but that switched a lot when I actually went to college, you know, and um, began to learn about the history of my people and what happened to our homelands. And that really flipped for me and it made me want to come home and it made me want to um, do something better for my homelands and my people. So my work has really been focused on environmental justice, climate justice, and just transition. Um, I've worked for different organizations, mostly uh, the key ones are Indigenous Environmental Network, Black Mesa Water Coalition, um, and Climate Justice Alliance. And I will say outside of these topics generally, something that um, uh, signifies, you know, me in this work is I really cared about movement building. I really cared about not just only Navajo people and not just only Indigenous people giving a crap, you know, <laughs> about these things, land and water and animals and people's health, but everybody, how can everybody <laughs> give a crap about these things and work for these things? So that has been a big part of my work as well. Um, I don't know if you all have seen the Just Transition Framework. This is it. I'm not going to go into details about it. It can look complicated, but it's really not. On your left side, you're seeing... So the gist of it is that um, 
every economy has certain things that make it up. They have resources and work towards a common purpose upheld by a governance system and an overarching worldview. So this framework is saying, all right, we live in the extractive economy. We use these one, two, like five pillars in these certain ways that are bad. On the right side, we want to have a living economy. We want to use these five pillars in a good way. And in the middle there, there's a bunch of strategies of how you can do that, right? So this was just a way for um, environmental justice and climate justice communities to connect and get to know what each other's are doing. I worked for Black Mesa Water Coalition for a good oh gosh, I don't even know anymore, <laughs> for several years as executive director. When I jumped in, I, I say I jumped in during the phase three of Just Transition. So past kind of these like Navajo Nation wide um, type of interventions such as the Navajo Green Economy Commission and Coalition, past kind of your straight up EJ organizing, which was to organize communities and educate communities to get them to intervene in things, um, you know, like, land leasing and approvals for different types of projects. I jumped in when we were moving towards the side of kind of like the economy that we want to build, you know, what does a good economy look like? That's when I started to work as the ED for BMWC. We had several projects, a solar project, which now has transformed into and, and, and spun off and gone off into an awesome organization called Native Renewables. We had our wool market improvement project, which was awesome. And we had our food sovereignty pilot projects, all awesome. Um, and then right before I left BMWC, I was saying, I say we moved into going into a phase four of just transition, which was really about the values and the culture. So we did all of this work. We did all these studies about how solar will be great on our reservation. We did all these like studies and reports about how these things would work and why we should do it and really came up against the wall in just in terms of people's belief and hope that it was possible to change things. So our strategies start to switch into restoring our culture, including ceremonies in our work, including cultural understanding in our work and decolonization and unlearning to touch not only people's like minds, but their spirit, their hope. The last project I did before I left BMWC in 2009 was the Indigenous Feminist Organizing School that we held in Sedona. Um, and it was super awesome. It's so, as far as I know, the first and only Indigenous Feminist Organizing School that has happened. Um, as Carmen kind of hinted at, there was a lot of people who didn't agree with it, right? <laughs> they didn't understand it, you know, a, an automatic resistance, this idea of feminism. But again, this to me was like my own personal real connection to how to change and challenge these values that we've grown up with. Back to the just transition framework. You'll see at the bottom, there's a little values filter and I don't know if it has like sediment and roots there. This to me is exactly, it exactly shows what's up with the environmental justice and climate justice movement is like, we have all these ideas when it comes to how to stop things and how to build stuff. But when it comes to values, how do we change people's values? That's just a box at the bottom that no one really gets how to do that, right? And that's where my focus has turned and been, um, is how do we expand that values filter into strategies? Um, an important way is to decolonize. What do I mean by that? I'll give you some examples. So I feel like in terms of the values filter, indigenous people have a really special role to play, you know, not just here in Flagstaff or the Southwest or the US or North America or the Americas, but the whole world, indigenous peoples have a really important part to play again in redefining these values. What do I mean by decolonized ways of thinking? So here's some examples. One is we strive for common understanding, not common definitions. So a lot of times in our, my organizing work, I see that we kind of run around and we're trying to get people to understand new definitions like that just transition framework, right? <laughs> but it, it's like, that's so limiting to, because there's always gonna be a new word, right? There's always gonna be a better definition, a more complete definition. So that's not all we should be doing. How do we get people to get to a place of common understanding, not just using common words? English language teaches us that, right? Because it's all nouns, to define, categorize, and rank. That's just what happens by using the English language. Indigenous language, on the other hand, 
are verb oriented, they're action oriented, and they focus on the relationship between things. So let's say here I'm sitting on the couch or a chair. In English, it's chair, right? Chair is that chair. But let's say in Navajo or an indigenous language that the quote unquote definition would be something like, okay, that thing that I sit on that gives me rest, right? So it's not about what the thing is, it's about how me and that thing interact. We honor and engage not only our mental selves, but also our physical, emotional, and spiritual selves. And that's kind of what I'm gonna try and lead us around in this talk. We honor diversity, you know, this idea of all my relations and I'm related to everything is, you know, it's, it's that inherently tells us that we honor diversity in things because that's the way the earth is naturally, right? Very diverse, <clears throat> excuse me. We learn by doing and experiencing, not solely the way that we're doing right now where we're just sitting and looking and learning things and learning definitions. No, we learn best by doing stuff. And the last bit is, yes, we do have a magical relationship with Mother Earth. And I'll come back to that later. This idea, I've heard a lot of young Indigenous people saying things like, oh, you know, we're not naturally born having a great relationship or special relationships or knowing, you know, having a spiritual relationship with animals and birds. But I argue that we actually do, right? <laughs> it's not something you're just born with and you get. And it, again, it's not the definition of an Indigenous person, but we do have that responsibility to take those actions to build that relationship. And that's everybody. Um, Crystal, this is a teaching that was taught to me by Steve Darden. I don't know if you know some of you here in Flagstaff know him. He's an awesome person. Um, he taught this to our Navajo organizing fellows at BMWC back in 2016. He was teaching us about quartz crystals. You know, they're part of Navajo medicine. You know. Um, you know, before Sedona and everything and all these things about crystals, this is just part of our culture and how he was saying that, and there's a lot of teachings about it. This one I'm gonna share with you is about that he said, when we have crystals in our get in our medicine, you know, it should be 12 sided. And he said, it's because the Navajo way of looking at things is that everything has at least 12 sides to it. It's not the mainstream way, which is like only two sides, right? Right, wrong uh god devil um republican democrat male female right <clears throat> maybe some neutral we might get in there right but these kind of binaries and dichotomies that were taught through english and through colonization that's not the navajo way and that really just blew my mind to be like what if i looked at everything at least 12 different ways <laughs> okay so let me pause here um, <clears throat> I don't know actually how, um, how we're doing this. If Alex or Carmen can jump on real quick. I had, I have a few questions in here to ask you all. I'm not sure if you all put it in a poll or we're just asking people to answer in the comment section. But oh yeah, we're just asking. So if you want to answer, uh, please do so in chat or, um, just very quickly verbally, if you want to do that as well. Yeah. Okay, great. I would say just do it in chat right now. You know, we'll have Q&A at the end and then we can maybe talk about these, but I'm just curious to know. Um, this, these quick examples I gave you about decolonization, the 12-sided quartz crystal, do you all out there have any other um, teachings or things to share as a part of your culture? Um, similar teachings or practices about decision making or looking at things or decolonization, please share it. These are just the Navajo examples that I'm giving you, but there's so many. So please share it in the chat. Great. Okay. And then also paintings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, this was my first painting. It's called Chahajef. Chahajef is like the darkness before dawn comes. And this was, <clears throat> I'm showing this to you because to me, this was like, it's a representation of my beginning of unlearning, right? Unlearning some of these ways of thinking. I, I, despite, you know, working for social justice and environmental justice and, you know, good things, you know, and worthwhile things and things that help my people, I still work like a capitalist, right? <laughs> I still worked myself to the bone. I ignored my health. I burnt myself out. I put my body second. I put my, you know, until my body was like, dude, stop. And I got cancer. I got um, 
endometrial cancer. So I had to have a total hysterectomy. And that's what this painting was about is not only, I, well, I had originally imagined just like a black hole right there, right? A hole of emptiness where I had had my hysterectomy and, and that was where the painting came from. But then looking back on it and meditating and painting and thinking about it, I realized like the power of that empty hole, the power of loss and how when you make that room, you have the ability to create something totally new to fill that space, to create what you want, the power of creation of us women, but everybody, not only to have a child, a physical human being to bring in the world, but the, the, the ability to create the life that we want. And that's what this painting is about. My unlearning of, in order to be a you know, worthwhile or correct member of society, I had to do, I had to work all this time, I had to, you know, put in all these hours, I had to put myself second, I had to have children, you know, all these different things that I assumed I had to unlearn, I was forced to unlearn, and that's painting as part of it. This is the second painting, which I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically my belly. <laughs> if you look at the mountain in the middle as my belly button, and my round belly, and these are was a triptych of after I had my hysterectomy, my scars. So right down that middle is scar is a scar and the staples that went into my belly and um, you know stretch marks and these things that happened to me because of that. And um, again, it's that unlearning of despite me thinking that scars and you know these are bad things, that they're actually a normal part of life, right? And they actually are beautiful. So transition translating and transforming those thoughts again part of my unlearning okay um i don't know why this thing popped up all of a sudden um so real quickly decolonizing then to me what i realized in terms of decolonizing was not only just like learning new things it was unlearning and this idea that unlearning is more important than learning um, um can't get rid of this down here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through all of this. I just wanted to talk a bit briefly, and I wrote an article about this. I'm sure that can be shared with you all later. Um, but it is this uh, idea and this just truth when I started to look back at unlearning, right? So it wasn't just like, it's the new economy that I want. It was like, what was our economy before? You know, how did it operate and how was it changed? And through this, through that kind of looking back, I realized how closely not only colonization and capitalism, extractive economy on Navajo Nation for sure, but also patriarchy were completely linked in colonizing our homelands and our people. Some examples of that would be in 1922 when the Business Council was formed, right? Um, that they just brought these three Navajo men who went through the boarding school systems because they didn't want to go through the traditional matriarchal system. They couldn't. To go through a traditional matriarchal system, would have, they would have never been able to sign these leases, right? So that was the beginning of when they're like, we need to get rid of this matriarchal system in order to impose this kind of economy that we want on the Navajo nation. And I was looking at it in terms of just when my grandfather was born, when my mom was born, and when I was born, how recently, you know, these um, policies and practices have happened um, to a way to push back to a lot of this kind of idea and belief that it was a long time ago, you know, it wasn't a long time ago, it was my mother's, you know, my mother's lifetime, my grandfather's lifetime, and my lifetime, that my mother was born right at the end of when they reduced um, the, the great livestock reduction. Again, another example of how they were taking power away from women to reduce or to take away our economic autonomy through our sheep culture, and just seeing that happen through history. Um, so then I learned, like going back, that, that the matriarchal system of Navajo people, the Net people, was our economic system. So now when I'm talking about decolonization, I'm saying bring back the matriarchy. Here's a painting, one of my paintings of my mom. So I'm, my mom 
uh, this is a picture of her when she was 18 years old attending art school in Chicago. So that's how, you know, I ended up, my dad's black from Chicago because she moved there to go to art school and only as an adult, like literally within the past years did I realize that my mom was part of the relocation programs, you know, that the goal of the relocation programs was to assimilate indigenous people by moving them into cities. And she was part of that. So this painting is not only just like an awesome, beautiful painting of my mom, picture of my mom, it's also representing that, right? Another question to add uh, your answers into the chat. Um, what role do you see yourself playing in a just transition to the regenerative economy? So what I'm offering is that for me, a big part of what I see is this idea of bringing back the matriarchy. What does that mean? Um, in the next, in the coming economy, when to me, it's just like a cycle going back around again. That's what I see my role being. And so the question is, what do you see your role being? Please answer in the chat. Oh, now I'm about to get into our emotional side. Uh, so this is a, one of my paintings. It's called, Why Am I Crying? And it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's this idea, again, when we talk about things like indigenous feminism, bringing back the matriarchy, it's a lot of unlearning these things that we've con been conditioned to learn about women and emotions and all these kind of things, right? So this idea that um, there are bad emotions that we shouldn't have, like anger, fear, sorrow and sadness, um, anxiety, unsure, like we're, we're talking about just ideas of, oh, press those, don't talk about them, get them, those are the things that you should avoid, right? But what I learned is like, we can't avoid them. <laughs> we can't avoid any emotion and that we have to honor our emotions, whatever they are, because they're powerful. Um, how can we use the power of our anger, of our fear, of our anxiety, of our sorrow purposefully? Our society has taught us not to use it purposefully, right? It uses those things against us. So that's part of the unlearning. Um, so for me, a big part of where I've experienced a lot of emotions, I feel a lot of emotions ever since I was a little girl is being half black and being half Navajo, right? And all of the internalized oppression I received from both sides, right? And internalized into myself as well. Um, this is something I'm trying to unpack again, unlearned. It's part of, for me, um, bringing back the matriarchy is to get a hold of these ideas, so really quickly, the way I look about it, Black people, Indigenous people, um, there is a lens of white supremacy that has been put over our eyes and we look at it no matter where we look. So when it comes to Black people, that lens is really about racism and anti-Blackness, this idea that Black people are at the bottom, white people are at the top, it's based on skin color and everybody else is in between, right? That's true. On the other hand, though, when it comes to indigenous peoples, that is not the lens. This, we don't look, we're, it's not the same lens that impacts us. Our lens of white supremacy is around colonization and invisibilization of indigenous peoples, right? So when we look at each other through these lenses created by white people, yes, indigenous peoples are racist and uphold anti-blackness and colorism. And yes, Black people uphold colonization, invisibilization, and appropriation of Indigenous peoples. So what does that do? That doesn't help us. Right? <laughs> it just keeps us all at the bottom. It's a, it's a divide and conquer type of thing. So here's an example. Let's talk about how with Black people, there's this one drop rule. Um, so this idea that if there's one drop of black in you, then you're black, right? This constant othering of black people, segregation and keep them over there, right? On the other hand, with indigenous peoples, there's a blood quantum right? <laughs> rule where it's like um, <clears throat> this idea that, oh, you're indigenous if you have even this amount of blood in you. Why is it different? When you think about it, it makes sense that they would want more black people, right? <laughs> because with the one drop rule, because that means more labor, 
-hmm. more slaves back then and more labor. I would say many of us are still slaves now, right? But in terms of indigenous people with blood quantum, they want to reduce the amount of indigenous peoples. Why? Because that gives them more access to land of indigenous peoples. And when you go back to that just transition framework, you realize how black people and indigenous peoples in the country have been used as labor and land resources, right? And they're uphold, help, held through these policies. So how then do we get rid of that? Right? <laughs> how do black people and indigenous peoples look at each other without those lenses. This is our work of now, okay? And not, obviously not just Black people, all kinds of lines and relationships, you know, <laughs> that need to, this question needs to be figured out. Art provides a way to do that, okay? This, the painting on your left is one of my paintings called Sankofa. It's a picture of a harpy eagle. And I remember seeing harpy eagles for the first time and thinking those look like Yeba Chase to me, like the power of them staring at you, this kind of like giant awe-inspiring power it reminded me of Yeba Chase. And so I wanted to paint the harpy eagle as a, a Yeba Chase, you know, kind of with those colors and in that mode. And I also called it Sankofa, which is down on the bottom right. It's a uh, uh, African... Um, uh, teaching of this bird who is looking behind him and reaching for an egg on its back. And it's this idea that we have to look back at our ancestors, our peoples, our culture to bring it forward to today to solve today's problems. So this is an example of how art I've used, I've tried to use art as a way to get Navajo and Black people to get on the same page of what it is that we're trying to do. Here's another um, painting of mine. It's called Gender Diversity is Our Legacy. So you're looking at it as a mirror. And on your right side, Navajo say your right side is your female side and your left side is your male side. That's all of us, right? So they are demarked by these kind of colors um, that are associated with male and female entities and the directions and the four sacred directions yellow and white you know changing woman and white show woman on our right side and then black and blue on our left side and then the headband being this rainbow which is actually the original um rainbow flag of the lgbtq movement and trying to combine these concepts right of navajo people saying we're all born as male and female and the lgbtq work together as a way for people to talk about these things together. And, you know, the LGBTQ rainbow, LGBTQI rainbow, as you see, it has two other colors which were in the original um, rainbow that aren't there anymore. Pink represented sex and turquoise represented magic and art. And those don't exist on the rainbow anymore, but I think they should. Okay, and regarding our emotional selves, how does a lens of white supremacy change the way you look at the world around you? So that's a question for you all to share in the chat. Okay, I got to start to wrap up here. Um, okay, so I'm not going to get super into this, but I'm kind of thinking about on the spiritual side of things. I'm not going to read through all this. I, but this idea about decolonization is not about making things better for Indigenous peoples under this current structure. Think, and, you know, these different types of colonialism. External colonialism is like, okay, the colonists left, but they left a big old mess, right? Settler colonialism is when they never left. So what I want you to recognize is here in the United States is an active settler colonial society. They never left, right? It's not a structure. It's not an event that happened in 1492. It is current and ongoing. It's happening now. We participate in it now, right? So decolonization is not about making things better for indigenous peoples under this current colonial structure. Okay, hashtag land back. Here's a bunch of... Jahan, you're, you're muted right now. What's the last part? There you, you heard? go. Um, it went off as soon as you turned. Yeah, yeah, to this slide. 
Sorry, y'all. Um, <clears throat> so what I was saying is, all right. So when we go to the spiritual aspect of ourselves, it's about, as Carmen said, connection to land. And this study, this that's in the middle of this, Chris, the study that was done October last year says indigenous resistance has staved off 20% of the US and Canada's annual emissions. That's the work that we do. Here's another fact, right? <clears throat> or statistic that only five-ish percent of the entire world can be considered indigenous peoples. Yet that 5% stewards 80% of the entire world's biodiversity. And another way to look at that is that indigenous peoples are 400% better than everybody else in taking care of the land. <laughs> so this is when we're talking about decolonizing too and connection to land, this is what it means also this idea that we, it's our responsibility. It's not our right to own land. I have the right to own this land. This land belongs to me. No, it's about we have our responsibility to take care of the land. And that's something that Indigenous peoples continue to do. And the statistics show this to you, right? Land back means to return stewardship to Indigenous peoples because we know what we're doing. Like without Indigenous peoples, this world would have already collapsed. You know? <laughs> and when we support Indigenous resistance, like at Standing Rock, like at the San Francisco Peaks, you know, like in Page, Arizona, to <laughs> stop in Navajo Generating Station, we're saving the planet by doing this, right? This has been our role. We talk about decolonization and not only Indigenous people decolonizing, but everybody, this is part of it, is that responsibility to take care of land, because otherwise we, we're all going to die. <laughs> Here's a painting of... Um, called Tuasta. So Tuasta is a deity also in Navajo. And to me, it was my first personal um, spiritual relationship I made was to the water. And I made a commitment outside of, oh, Navajos are supposed to do this. So we're, I'm going to do it. And outside of our organization is going to make this offering. But for me, myself, personally, was a commitment to go and make offerings at the Pacific Ocean every year, right, <laughs> for so many years because of this being, right? So that's what this painting is about. And then this is basically my latest painting. For those, it's Stoke Oslid here, the San Francisco Peaks with some kind of hidden meanings in it, right? So um, the abalone shell is something that Navajo people associate with this mountain that is adorned with abalone shell. It makes a lot of sense as you begin to learn more and more about Navajo culture. Also, it's the color yellow. It's the color of twilight, the setting sun, fall time, love, eh, family, relationships. This is what that mountain is. Steve Darden called it the mountain of love. <laughs> and this is our relationship to it. And I put this white dragon on top as a way to maybe hope, like get people to understand the power of this mountain right? <laughs> by putting a, a, a dragon on top of it symbolizing that journey you know of like let's say in lord of the rings or <laughs> the hobbit when they have to go to get something from the dragon you know this wise old creature of knowledge and riches that resides on the top of the mountain being an allegory to like our journey of knowledge and growing as people as human beings individually and as families and and collectively that to look at this mountain in a different way, not just like a recreational place where we can go looky-loo about and take hikes and go skiing and have a good time, but <clears throat> representative of a certain holder of knowledge that we have the blessing to live next to. Last question. <clears throat> We're already engaging our spiritual selves in decolonization. How are you inspired to strengthen your spiritual relationship? with Mother Earth. And I think that is my last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing. I know it was kind of all over the place, but remember that 12-sided crystal? <laughs> I'm not trying, I'm trying to provide many aspects of how I think about this topic as opposed to here's the definition. And if you do A, B, and C, you get it. No, it's not that way. We have to build our understanding in a much larger way. Um, and so I'll stop there and 
turn it back to Carm. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation, Jahan. Um, beautiful artwork. Uh, I just wanted to say that maybe now is just a, a time for us to turn on our cameras um, and just just reflect, share any thoughts that you that came across to you as she was sharing about this knowledge around environmental justice, climate justice, as it pertains from the indigenous lens. Um, or if you have any thoughts about or want to learn more about the meaning or interpretations behind some of the paintings that Jahan shared, uh, please feel free to. Yeah, so I'm just looking through some of the comments now too. So maybe even some folks want to start there. I can go ahead and get just get the conversation started with a, um, a question that I had as you were going through. I was just curious because um, my own journey with understanding and learning about indigenous feminism, remember going back to the initial comment of, oh, a lot of people at first are kind of averse to this concept of feminism because we see the disconnects between um, those concerns and our concerns as indigenous women, femmes. Uh, when did you first start your learning journey with this movement? Mm -hmm. You know, I think I started early. I found like a high school paper that was on the feminine mystique or the feminist mystique when I was in high school. So I feel like, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, I grew up around a lot of violence, especially violence against women. And so I, already, I grew up being like, Ugh, this kind of anger at men. Right, of how they treated women and or how I, I in my experience I saw men treat women um and it wasn't until like later you know and so I feel like I started you know with this thinking of that very basic thinking of this is wrong this is wrong and I and I don't think it needs to be more complicated than that Oh, as you get an adult you go to college and you learn terms and there's def definitions that's what makes it complicated Right. So again, it's that kind of way of learning that I have to unlearn. Like, it's not complicated. This is a wrong thing to do. Right? It's a wrong. Why is it that we have this epidemic of murdered and missing indigenous women? Like, how often is like, it's a common place to be like, <clears throat> even in like, not even Navajo, but everywhere, this idea of like, oh, that weird uncle, or oh, that weird cousin. I mean, it's jokes. It's jokes in movies. Everybody knows that there's this weird relationship going on <clears throat> that keeps women lower. It's, it's not, I, I think it, it, we have to uncomplicate it. But I think as I became an adult <clears throat> and I started to work actually in, as an activist and in organizing, and then I really began to see like, oh, I do not relate you know, <laughs> to this, right? I don't relate to this because my mom was a homemaker, you know, she cleaned the house. There's nothing wrong with cleaning the house. There's nothing wrong with taking care of the home. There's nothing wrong with raising children, but these people think there's something wrong with it, right? And I did have that until I went to... Um, like a, one of my first feminist organizing schools before the indigenous one, which is why I wanted to bring it here and just had it broken down and, 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 and re, repackaged towards me to just be like, you already know this is happening. You know, this is just about fixing these things that we already see happening. Um, and I think also just connecting with other women of color. And, you know, that is really important because it is a different feeling to be the one brown person with a bunch of white women versus with a bunch of women of color. And it also is different to be one indigenous person in a room full of women in color, of color, you know? But these are the kind of things that we have to like seek out, right? Cause they're just not always offered up to us so easily. So for me, it came later, but once I, once I just kind of got over this like initial, mm, I don't think that like that, almost like an ego about it, you know, or, or it's like I was feeling like Navajo women were being challenged. 
you know, once I just try to be like, hey, this isn't about me. This isn't about my mom. This isn't about my grandma. You know, this is just about the fact that the society sees women as less than, you know, then I was able to undo that. But I think that just um, underlines again, this idea of like unlearning is more important than learning. Get those lenses off of you <laughs> that have been put, up, put on us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for um, expanding on that. So maybe a question to the audience, you know, in this quest to build community in such a short amount of time, I know when I'm at different presentations, it's hard to, it's hard to be the first one to, to ask a question or to talk, but maybe um, the question to you, an easy one would be, um, what interested you in joining the conversation tonight? Uh, anything about the topic? Um, do you know Jahan? Did you want to get to know a little bit more about what she's doing with environmental justice and this um, this connection to indigenous feminism? What was it for you? Sure. Thank you, um, Jaime. I'm going to go ahead and put that question in chat. Yeah, or even if you didn't get anything I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay too. Because, uh, you know, like I think like each of these little pieces could be like a giant workshop, but I'm all just trying to like throw things at you. So, I get, but it takes some processing, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would just say that that's it for me. I just have had so many reflections. I don't even know, like, I can't even focus on one. Um, but this is really amazing. Thank you. I feel like I just need to take time to process all of this and, and kind of think about it. And yeah, it's it's a lot of really important things, but it's just, it's, yeah, it's a lot to process. I, I think what, I mean, I know that I'm part of the planning and that's why I'm here, but it's not only the reason why I'm here, but um, I, it really stuck to me when you were talking about loss um, and loss having power, the power of creation. And I think that something that I, often reflect on is loss. I, you know, I come from an experience of migration and I think now I am in my thirties, but I came when I was 16. And now that I am in my thirties, I am realize, realizing of everything that I lost. Um, because when you first come to the US, you're just pushed into so many different crises that you can't even think about what you're losing in the way. And then now I am in this experience of chronic mourning um, of things that I didn't even realize that I lost <laughs> until now when I have time to breathe. Um, and I, I am, I'm going to take that with me thinking that, yes, you are mourning and there's, there are things you've lost, but what is the power, what have you created? So not really make myself get stuck in that limbo of loss, but actually see what are all the things that I've created um, through this experience of displacement um so yeah thank you for that i i think that was super powerful powerful and affirming for me to hear you're welcome yeah i think like it's be it's it's like this idea of like we have to honor our emotions and we've been taught to ignore 
most of our emotions, right? Or just like, we're only supposed to be happy all the time, right? That's humans always be happy and everything else is bad. Like that's such a lie, right? <laughs> that's such a lie. And it's, and the thing is, is like, if we don't honor our emotions, we don't get rid of them. They're still there and they control, they are powerful and they control us in another way, right? In a different way, you know? but it doesn't have to be that way and this is men and women right a lot of times it's like we can make it a gender thing because they say like women are so emotional right and it's a bad thing women can't be leaders because they're too emotional right like all the presidents say this that is such bs like emotions make you stronger being able to deal with emotions means you're a strong person right (laughs) not a weak person And so there's something, again, we have to unlearn is this idea, many of it, that there's good emotions and there's bad emotions that, you know, only certain emotions should be worth, are worthwhile. You know, it's all of them. All of them are trying to teach. Otherwise, why would us humans have them? Why would we feel this way if we weren't supposed to feel that way (laughs) for some reason? You know, so it's, how do we do that? And it's rocky and crazy. And, you know, as a person who also thought emotions are you know should be put to the side (laughs) totally it's really a hard thing to unlearn that and I'm not even close it's I still get caught up in my emotions where even sometimes I don't know where they're coming from they're probably coming from some ancestor or some childhood memory or something or some connection to something that might not even I don't even know. So it's like, again, trying to remove my mind from my emotions and stop, stop trying to be like, well, I have to understand it and I have to know where it's coming from. And I have to know exactly what to do about it. And I have, you know, no, I just have to honor it. And for me, a big way that I've learned to do that is through painting. That's a way that I'm like, oh, I can just, I don't even know what I'm feeling, but I'm just going to throw stuff at you know and that's a way that I'm learning through art to be able to deal with my emotions and it is and it does have a lot to do with indigenous feminism doesn't it (laughs) because it's like I'm learning this idea that emotions are something and again this mountain that we live under for those of us who live here in town this is a mountain of emotions that's where we live Mm -hmm. (laughs) that must mean something that this mountain must have so many teachings for us in in that area you know I'm not saying I know them I'm just saying (laughs) I think they must be there for us to explore (laughs) any other questions reflections that you want to share with Jahan about her artwork or Any concepts, ideas that she presented tonight? Hi, um, I'm a little late to the conversation, but I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated you bringing together these areas. Um, I think it's something that you know, when you're raised um, in your own homelands, these are things that are sort of intrinsic to you that you don't necessarily separate them in your own mind. Um, But then when we are sort of thrown into these Western kind of institutionalized systems, we, we, we begin to separate that. And, you know, I was really intrigued about your question of this lens of white supremacy. Um, And it, it, you know, I think that's something that I've been sort of grappling with for a really long time. Um, I come from a very intertribal family um, and, you know, it's something that's faced me. It, it's been different dimensions of who I, I am and it's come up in, in very violent ways in my own communities. And so it really interested me in just sort of bringing together these concepts and, and also you know, creating the space for indigenous feminisms. I think it's something that, um, you know, we are a very small population and, and are tend to be forgotten and, and isolated. 
in a lot of these larger pictures when it comes to who is America and, and you know, the demographics. But, you know, and, and you had a really great point where you're speaking about the diversity, like this biodiversity and, and who manages that and, and who supports that and who stewards that. And it's that knowledge that our ancestors have had, you know, since time immemorial and that they've shared with us through our songs and our prayers, right? These kind of protocols. And so, you know, in my own work here, at the, um, I'm the director at the Native American Cultural Center you know, I, I have a lot of students who are looking for, you know, knowledge and, and who are looking for direction. And so, you know, these are areas I think that we need to bring into these academic spaces and, and conversations um, because these are things that impact our, our everyday experiences, right? And so for me, one of the things that actually brought me here is an incident that um, happened to somebody that's very close to me and, and this sort of, this idea behind our matriarchy um, as Navajo women, right? But then when we put that to the test, and this is sort of where that lens of white supremacy has come in, where uh, one of my friends was a victim and of, of violence and of somebody who has great stature in our community, and yet their, their plea for help was dismissed because of who this person was. And to me, that is not upholding our matriarchy. And, and, and so I think we really need to begin to think about how are we upholding colonization and, and even this sort of self-colonization in how we support and, and don't support one another. And so for me, it's been about sort of self-discovery of how do I change the culture? And, and how do I begin to make change amongst my own friends and family, sisters, aunties to, to face that, right? And, and it comes from all of these different dimensions. And so I really just, I needed to hear what you had to say. And so I just really appreciate you um, being here and, and sharing your art um, and, and just your experience, because those are things that you know, I really needed to hear, but I, I really want to encourage all of us to think about that and how we unconsciously uphold patriarchy and violence and colonialism when we sort of, you know, we believe other people or we're, we're willing to ignore things about somebody but it's, it's meting out violence against women and children, right? And so that's something that I, I really want us to start thinking about as a community, but also as this sort of think tank, if you will, right? We're creating this space together and, and we're contributing to these ideas. And so that's something that I, I, really, I really want to see changing um, in our communities. And so you know, I sort of challenge you all to, to take that conversation to your tables and, and to the home fires and, and address that because it, it, it needs to be, we have people who are hurting in our communities and, and Mother Earth, right? Like she's hurting and, and we see the violence there and, and there's so many different ways we can take that conversation. But um, I just wanna leave you all with that. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you got something from it. Um, I think like our world, it, it's it's becoming even more emotional because our world has repressed it for so long. So it it's like we've we've reached where a lot of us are recognizing we reached this kind of plateau in terms of like um, our ecology and you know. Um, parts per million of carbon dioxide or you know we, we're re we some of us are you know we're like we okay we're we understand that we're reaching that limit that physical limit of mother earth we understand that we're reaching this limit of like haves and have nots and like our capitalist system and find how our finances work and bailing out the banks and a lot of us are realizing we've reached that limit like oh man this system just don't work no more right but we also need to realize we've reached a limit in, in how we think too. You know, um, 
a lot of the things that we're going to have to deal with that we are dealing with, like the pandemic, like let's talk about the impacts of climate change that are coming down the bend, right? And fighting over resources, fighting over water. If these things are all going to be coming, how are we going to deal with that when we don't know how to deal with those deeply impactful, emotional, spiritual things? We're going to be challenged with very hard stuff. You know, and so we have to also like expand the way that we think and the way that we operate in the world in order to meet those challenges that are coming down the way. And I think we're just beginning to get a taste of that now, right? Like how many people, like how many people that I know, um, including myself, right? I left BMWC and right before the pandemic, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get to go travel and do this. No. I just gotta stay at home, but I, but I, but I started painting. <laughs> but um, you know, we so many people I know can't sit still. So many people I know can't not work. If they're not busy, if they can't run around and be like, "I'm so busy," "Oh, I'm too busy," "Oh, I gotta do this," they don't know what to do with themselves. That's a problem. You know, like that's a problem and that was a problem for me like I felt so I felt more anxiety from not doing stuff than I felt from being busy and I mean talk about somebody to unlearn I'm still trying to unlearn that it's very challenging you know but but that's what I mean when we reach this the limits of this um we're gonna really have to change the way that we operate in the world too <sighs> mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I just want to draw some attention to some comments that we received in the chat box. Uh, Abby Stewart earlier had said, yes, emotions are a human innate ability that we should consider an advantage rather than a hindrance. Being emotionally intelligent is just as important as any other characteristic or feeling. And then Lisa Dom said, fantastic presentation. I learned so much and I am grateful for your teaching. Uh, and then Michael Patillo, I really enjoyed the connections between social movement, just framework, art, and the personal journey through learning life loss. I think that we often hear about these as separate, but they are very interconnected to me. That belief that feeling things are separate from thinking things is a very Western settler colonial worldview. And thank you for giving a multi-dimensional view. Any other? And then Christina. Yes, I think everyone feels it. And let's see. Oh, lost that one. Okay. So as we begin to wrap up here, um, any last final thoughts, reflections you want to share? Uh, we will be sharing Jahan's contact information in just a bit. If you want to share those offline and just have a conversation with her on her own. So I'm just waiting. I just want to add Jahan. Hi, Jahan. It's so great to see you and to hear your thoughts. Um, I think I was drawn to this primarily because it was you that was presenting. <laughs> and then also just, uh, I was just curious about just your journey. Um, I remember when, again, at the start of the pandemic, when we first went to your art show and saw your paintings and, you know, just curious about your journey and, and how that evolved, um, you know, throughout the pandemic. So, so yeah, so thank you for sharing your thoughts and it's good to see you. I'm still trying to figure it out. Just kidding. Yeah. I'm like, it's like, I've been an activist this whole time and then I'm like, oh, but I want to do art, but I don't know how to do it. And I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just kind of like, figuring it out still you know this month April I was like the first month where I was like I'm not besides this you know I'm not doing any contract work or anything I'm just only going to focus on painting you know so that's the first time I've ever even tried that but I'm excited for it um it, for me it is just a bunch of unlearning because in the beginning I was like well painting doesn't really help nobody you know I supposed to be out here shutting down like these natural gas proposals and you know and like that's what I'm used to doing 
And so it's, I'm still learning and unlearning like how to mesh these things, but kind of where I'm landing is like, oh, okay, art can be a way to talk, to, to have conversations about complicated things that, you know, um, it's hard to just talk as in words, you know? So I, I'm kind of there and I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing, but I'm committed to it, right? Be committed to evolving into a more holistic person. And for me, a big part of that is to paint and write, you know? <laughs> and even if I'm not making money off of that, it's still, I still have to prioritize it. So that is a new, a new learning that I'm trying to stick fast to. And good to see you too. All righty. So as we begin to wrap up, thank you again so much for being here. As you see on the slide here, if you want to learn more about Jahan and her work, um, as well as look more deeply at her artwork, uh, you can visit her website. And she also has an Instagram page. There is her hand, her username. Uh, next. So please, again, let us know how we did. If you want to, uh, if you have any ideas about what we should cover next, how you felt about this presentation, uh, we want to hear all of it. Uh, it helps us improve and helps us get ready for continuing conversations around health equity and art and the creation of new futures that center health equity. So please um, take a visit, go to the link provided there, or you could use your phone and scan that QR code. Um, Alexandra can put the link in chat. So if you have time to do that very quickly, um, that would be awesome. And then finally, I think we have one final slide. So. Again, thank you. This was a presentation of the Fairness First campaign. Uh, we have a calendar of events that are upcoming, so just visit our website and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and, and Facebook as well. And you have contact information for myself and Alexandra Samaron. Um, email us, get in touch with us, and let us know how we can collaborate as well. So a hat to Jahan, to the organizers, and for everyone who gave their time tonight to form community around these important topics. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.